name is Mike Bynum. As the lead pastor of Grace Life Church, I'd like to be the first to welcome you to our online service. I'm here to let you know that myself, our staff, and many others are here to care for you and equip you on your spiritual journey, no matter where you're joining us from. We can do that in person here on Morrell Road in Rockledge, and we can also do that online. But to do that, we have to know each other. So if you're new to Grace Life Church, welcome. We are thrilled you are joining us. The best way to let us know you are here is by commenting in the chat. There, you can share a prayer request, ask questions, or let us know if you'd like a member of our staff to reach out to you this week. You can also use the QR code to be directed to our website, where you'll have a chance to contact us more privately as well. And as your pastor, if there is anything I can do to help you grow spiritually or take your next step here at Grace, I encourage you to reach out to me directly at mbynum at gracebavard.org. I look forward to getting to know you. Here at Grace, we are about helping people become passionately devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And today's service is designed to do just that. So let's participate together.
Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. desire a relationship with him, but the best part is that he also desires a relationship with us. This song says that he did not want heaven without us, so he brought heaven down. God doesn't need us in any capacity. The Bible tells us if we don't cry out, the rocks will, but he desires a relationship with each and every one of us so much that when humanity fell in the garden and sin put a divide between us and God, he said, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to send my son and he's gonna die on a cross and he's gonna redeem each and every person. Whether they wanna have a relationship with me or not, I want them. And I want them to have a way to be in heaven with me forever.
of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear the chains falling. And I hear the chains falling. chains falling and I hear the chains falling I hear the chains falling I hear the chains falling I hear the chains falling
All right. Whew. Wow. So I just learned that's a mashup. That second and third song is a mashup. Okay. All right. I get the privilege this morning of uh, uh, praying for our offering this morning, so the ushers are preparing, as we are asking you to as well. Oh, I remember a couple of weeks ago, Ed and uh, Tony had a little interaction, and it reminded me again today, we don't give to get, we get to give. I don't have to say a whole lot more after that, so if you would, just bow your heads with me for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, it is a privilege, but it is yours from the very beginning. And all we have to do is to be great stewards of what you have given us so that we get to give. And Lord, let us give without the left hand knowing what the right hand is doing. Let us just give with grateful hearts this morning. And so, Lord, we just ask for your hand upon each and every one of us here that the monies that we provide is going to be able to glorify you, honor you, and praise you this morning. And we give it to you for your glory. And everybody together said, Amen. Amen. Ha ha. You thought that was going to be the end of Simon. All right, uh, a quick announcement. Go ahead, ushers, please. Thank you. Uh, on June the 12th, we aired a video called Break the Huddle. Oh, first of all, good morning. Hi, everybody. Whether you're here for the very first time or you're back since 2020 or you're visiting us for the very first time and you folks at home, it's great to have you with us or wherever you may be. If you're at the beach, I hope the sand between your toes is doing well. June the 12th, we aired a, new, aired a video called Break the Huddle. It reminds us of the opportunity for all of us to serve our community. So I'm excited about that, and I'm hoping that you're getting excited. And so uh, some of you may have a recollection of when that is. That is just over 60 days from today. 60 days from today. We're going to be able to do one major thing, which is convey our identity, show that we're a church in action, and taking our church outward to serve in our community. So, how do we identify ourselves? How do we show that we are willing and ready to serve with others? One way can be that we have something that clearly shows who we are. Some of you may already have from previous Break the Huddles. You may have an old Break the Huddle t-shirt. Guess what? It qualifies. It's light blue. I've got an example here. We also have other shirts. But we're also going to be having a T-shirt sign up in the back. Now, does that mean that you can't participate if you don't have a T-shirt? Absolutely not. But wouldn't it be great for you to be able to stand there and say, hey, look, Grace Life, that's me. We're ready. So <clears throat> we're going to have a coordination day the week before so that we can identify what we need for supplies and materials. And so there'll be a sign up in the back. So real quick, I just wanted to take 10 seconds to say, some of you have seen this already, right? Everybody knows what that is? That's our identifier, right? Who is this? Grace Life Church. All right. Well, I don't know what that was, a guitar pick? Yep. So guess what's going to be on the back? Break the huddle, serving the community. I am excited. I'm hoping you're going to get excited. What does the t-shirt look like right now? It is a very nice 4.3 ounce fine texture. So, so with that, the t-shirt is sort of step one. If you'd like to get a t-shirt, obviously we want to be able to allow the next how many Sundays? Three Sundays. All right, next three Sundays. Throwing pens, guitar picks, all kinds of stuff. Next three Sundays, you have the ability to sign up and order your T-shirt. What we would like is money. Sorry about that, but they don't come free. All right, 10 to 12 bucks-ish. We have young and we have large. And we have 
folks that are willing and folks that are mature, there's all kinds of opportunities. I will not read them off, but there are plenty of places we're going to be serving or standing or doing. And what a better way than to identify ourselves with the Grace Life Church emblem. And you can get a t-shirt in the back. All right, everybody with me? Let's do it. Chameleons, interesting little creatures. I don't think I would say that thing is pretty, would you? You would? Look. Yeah. I has, don't their eyes operate independently of each other? That's, yeah. They're, they're, they're kind of strange, but, you know, one of the main reasons, I'm not a zoologist or biologist, and so I, I don't know the purpose of their existence, but one thing I know they do well is they fit in well. They fit in well, right? They, they, they we're told that they change their coloring so they blend into their background, and you can see that right here. You, you see that there's some green leaves and then uh, some dirt and some, uh, apparently some kind of branch right there. So that little guy's doing okay, and uh, I, I think he's having a good day. I don't know. They eat bugs, I'm sure. So uh, let, let's see this next uh, buddy of his. This one's a little different. I think he uses moose on his hair. You kind of see how it's standing up. Um, but yeah, they know how to grab onto branches pretty well. But again, they blend into their background. You see there's a lighter background, and he blends in quite well. But I, I thought, well, there's got to be another look that, that would possibly entertain us today. Let, let's look at this next slide here. Now, there, that's a perfect meme, right? What is the one telling the other one? Now, let's not get funny and guess who's the male and who's the female, okay? <laughs> you know, th what's funny is you can see the ones talking to the other one, and <laughs> the one that's not saying anything is looking like, yeah, okay, whatever. whatever. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I don't, does anybody have a guess of what that one's saying to the other one? Anybody just right now, something hits you? Take the trash out. Take the trash out? Uh, how about you're driving too fast or something? Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know, but I thought, I thought man, if I would have got together and had a, the capability to have, all, we could all weigh in on what it is and put it in digitally, we can have them flying across the bottom of the screen. We could have a good time with that. But yes, these two are chameleons as well. Uh, the other one probably wish he was a bird where he could fly away and get away from the other one, but... Yeah, chameleons, they're interesting, and we do want to talk about this uh, over the next handful of weeks about, you know, fitting in or standing out. What is God's call on our life as Christians, as Christ followers in this sinful world, even in our own country that is post-postmodern, by the way, and is also known no longer as a Christian nation? And that is even with the United Nations. We, we have ceased to be labeled as such. So there are many opportunities, many opportunities for each one of us to stand out. But the struggle is, as Christ followers, some of us would love to be chameleons and just fit in. 
That desire to fit in is more powerful than the desire to stand out. Now, to stand out doesn't mean that we are hateful people and all we preach is what we are against. No, not at all. We would be standing out if we just preached Christ. If we just preach the good news of Jesus, amen, the salt and light, and, and that we just said, wait a minute, what you are saying that is popular and well-received in our own country does not align with Scripture. Let me tell you what Scripture is. I'll not only tell you, but I'll live it out. Guess what? Whether you want to or not, you are going to stand out. You will look weird, some of us are kind of on the way already, but, you know, we will look weird. Why? Because we'll be different. And it's not that Jesus calls us just to be different, to be different. He's called us to be holy. <clears throat> now, to be holy <clears throat> in a sinful world, that will show up as different. So over the next four weeks, we'll be talking about fighting that urge to fit in. And this is not directed only to high schoolers and junior highers. Of course, they're out with our youth pastor right now. But this is for we as adults as well. We should stand out with our attitudes. We should stand out with our words. We should stand out with our actions, and our God is calling us to do so. Today we're beginning again a new ser series, sermon series about standing out. It is called Chameleon, Fight the Urge to Fit In. And having said all that, let me just have a short prayer conversation with our Father, okay? God, help us now. Help us to fight the urge to check our cell phones. Help us to fight the urge to, to, to write notes to ourselves of something that we got to do later today. God, help us to give you 100% of our attention today. God, help us to open our ears. Help us to open our hearts so we would allow you to speak to us. God, you don't scream your messages to us. God, you want us, if we love you, to be willing to sit by and at your feet and saying, Father, teach me. God, could we each say that? Right now, God, teach me. And then God, help us each one that we would have the courage to act on what it is you're going to reveal to us. A a as our brother in Christ James says, to not only be hearers of the word of God, but doers of it. Help us to put feet to our faith that we might please you. And God, as a whole, God, whether we are here in this room or we're watching from home or some hotel room or wherever we might be in, on this planet right now listening for you to speak to us here about fitting in or standing out, God, I pray that there'll be more of us saying, I am choosing to stand out for the glory of God and the power of God so that God might be, do, be doing something wonderful in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's talk about this main principle today of fighting the urge to fit in. I think to some degree, every single one of us fight the urge to fit in. Some more than others, to be sure. But in doing so, we need to, to look at this, this thought of a, a conforming lifestyle. Because there are moments in time where we might conform to a particular situation. Some do it more than others, and some, man, it is characteristic of how we live our lives, and yet we call ourselves Christ followers. I find it interesting to look in the New Testament book called James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this letter. He wrote it to Christian Jews, and he identifies them in this particular passage here in verse 4, chapter 4, you adulterous people, don't you know? That friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Wait a minute. He's not fooling around here. He's calling them out. Anyone, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes what? 
an enemy of God. That is harsh. It's God's word. Up to this point, James addresses in the first three chapters his recipients, his readers, as brothers, even dear brothers. But here he calls them out as adulterous people. But Now, by doing so, he's not insinuating that they are involved in some type of, of sexual immorality. No. What he's calling them out on is in reference to their relationship with God. Often the Old Testament compares the relationship between God and Israel as a marriage relationship. God is consistently portrayed as the husband, while Israel as the wife. Therefore, when Israel's relationship with God is threatened by its idolatry, it can be accused of committing Adultery. What is adultery as we understand it in, in social context of, between husband and wife? Adultery, of course, is unfaithfulness from one spouse to the other, going outside that marriage covenant relationship to experience in a sexual nature with someone else. They're unfaithful, and this is a lesson that we see of Israel being unfaithful to God when they say, no longer do I give myself totally or ourselves totally to you, God. This idolatrous action and this God here and that God there and this rebellion is more attractive, so I'm going to try to have it both ways. And you know, even if you've, some of you have ever tried this in your life, that doesn't work. We can't have it both ways. We're told our God is a jealous God, right? Let's keep moving. This marital imagery for the covenant relationship between God and Israel is picked up by Jesus in the book of Matthew when he called those who rejected him, listen, he called them a wicked and adulterous generation. How would God define us? in this generation, even down into our, our own country within America with those who call themselves followers of Christ, true Christians, would he say, oh, you're my beloved faithful one, or would he say, you adulterous generation? Hey, what would he say of our congregation? You faithful ones, or would he say, you adulterous people. What if he looked at you and he said, be careful not to look at anyone. Okay, so <laughs> if he said, you right here, you say you are a follower of Christ. You say these things, but I know you. You adulterous person who claims to follow me and love me your heart is so divided. It's not even divided, it's fragmented. And God says, I want all of you. This is what we are confronted with today. So James, in our text here, follows this tradition of using adulterers to label his readers as unfaithful people of God. By seeking friendship with the world, they are, in effect, committing spiritual adultery. We can understand why James insists that anyone who chooses, who chooses, not made to, but they choose to be a friend of the world, becomes, quote, an enemy of God. One might think that to be an enemy of God, you know, you, you have to be a Satanist. Or you, 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 you have to be uh, a, an atheist, or a murderer, something really bad. But for James, his readers, as we study the book of James, we find out that what they're being called out on, that they were acting like the world by, listen, by discriminating against people. If you do this, you are no longer a friend of God, but of the world, and therefore an enemy of God. Uh, for those by speaking negatively about others. Guess what? You're a friend of the world and therefore an enemy of God. 
Well, those, they were exhibiting bitter envy and selfish ambition. God says, I don't care what comes out of your mouth, what you say you are, you are a friend of God and therefore my enemy. You are acting like the world. They don't know any better. The, the, the condemnation is not against the world. It's those who know better and claim to know him as Savior. And they're choosing to act like those who don't know any better. Also, he's calling them a friend of the world by pursuing their own destructive pleasures. And he wants to call them out. See, James wants his readers to see their compromising. Their compromising conduct for what it really is. You know, compromise can be a very good thing. It can be, right? Husbands and wives. Yeah, right? You know, it's nice to have a team mentality. There's compromising. But you know, it can also be very destructive. You compromise your values. You compromise what you know uh, is wrong and you start to do it because well this reason and that reason and often why because you want to fit in and not with your high school friends but with your buddies after work see the ladies in the neighborhood or the ladies at work or whomever it might be it's this compromising and james wants to call his readers out for what it really is see god tolerates no evil and, and he also tolerates no rival. No rival. See, when believers behave in a worldly manner, they demonstrate at that point their allegiance is to the world rather than to God. Man, that just kicked me right in the stomach this week. It's thinking this through. Let me say this again. When believers, followers of Christ, behave act like, talk like, think like the world in a worldly manner, they demonstrate at that point their allegiance, not to God, but to the world. Shame on us when we do so. The Apostle Paul speaks to, to this issue of compromising and conforming in the, in the great rich book of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and in the first verse it reads this way, therefore, going back to the first 11 chapters, okay, then he goes into verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, people who know Christ, who claim to be a follower of his, okay, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, totally sold out to God, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do you know when you live in obedience to Jesus Christ, that's worship. When you live according to the word of God and you are faithful to him, do you know that is worship to him? And then we go to verse 2. Do not conform any longer, any longer, because you were doing this, is what he was saying. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, once your mind is transformed, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, many of us, can remember how important it was to fit in in our high school years. Some of us, well, junior high was kind of a blur and a couple of years you'd rather forget. That was me. I, I, you know, I was doing okay in, in elementary school. I hit junior high and I was one awkward kid, man. I withdrew and what have you. But, you know, I kind of came out of that funk in high school a little bit. But, uh, you know, I didn't fit into the party and scene and all that that some of my friends continued on with praise God and only by the grace of God because I was certainly on that path but uh, he saw fit to uh, put me into a great church and a great youth group and youth pastor and and just was stirring within my own heart uh, to own my own faith but um, listen the desire to fit in you know it can feel like the only way to be popular uh, or well liked is by conforming your personality and, and habits to those around you who appear to have it all together you want to be popular? Don't play in the marching band. <laughs> Come on. 
You want to be on the cheerleading squad, or you, you, you want to be in with the, the in crowd or the whatever else. No knock against cheerleaders. I think they're great. So, you know, I had a niece that cheered collegiately and all that, so I'm, I'm all behind that. So anyway, um, but just to, to fit in, to see what they're doing. But see, <laughs> now you may have entire friend groups that know nothing of your faith. Or who you are as a Christ follower as you've taken some of us, that pattern throughout life. If you're well liked, you know something? It's a sham. It's a sham because they like the phony you. The you you pretend to be. It's a lose, lose, lose situation. You're letting yourself down, number one. Number two, you're keeping your friends from knowing Jesus. And third, you're disappointing the one who loves you passionately, God himself. What happens when the patterns and behaviors you've been exposed to for years become your habits and characteristics? What if you don't like them? What if you don't like who you've become? There must be confrontation. This can obviously happen in many different ways, both externally and internally. We can expect that we will, at different times in our lives, be confronted with the truth of God. And so with that in mind, let's, let's jump on into our next point, and that is confronting the conforming. Confronting the conforming. We've talked about how easy it is to conform. But if we're not happy with ourselves, we're not happy with that, that, that type of existence, folks, we have to confront if we want something supernatural to happen. You know, we can see firsthand what divine confrontation might look like in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. In John 4, Jesus had an encounter with a woman at the well, uh, actually a woman from Samaria. Now, that's a big deal, Jesus being Jewish, this woman being a Samaritan. Matter of fact, just even a man and a woman greeting each other on the street was not common like it is in our culture. That just was not socially, morally acceptable. And on top of that, she's Samaritan, he's Jewish. See, th these cultures did not do well with each other. If you were a Jewish person at that time and you needed to travel and the shortest po point was to go from Galilee down to, to uh, Judea, you'd go right through Samaria. No, you'd go the long way around so you would not walk into the region of Samaria. Why? You didn't want to interact at all with the Samaritans. You saw them as lesser people than yourself. Jesus said, that's crazy. I'm not getting caught up in these social mores here I, I, and boundaries. I'm going to go right through Samaria. Why? Because he says, I'm concerned that all become followers of Christ and have their sins forgiven. So in fact, as we continue on, we find that he goes to meet this woman as she comes out to draw water at this well around noonday. She's by herself. Why? Because all the other women in the, in the town would have come earlier in the morning or later in the day when it's cooler. She came at noon because she knew she'd be by herself and would not have to interact with the other women and hear all the things that she knows they're saying about her, but at least she doesn't have to hear it. So she comes at this time, and that's where Jesus intersects. Now see, Jesus meets her and offers her living water. Great, great master teacher, great at, at, at using object lessons. She's drawing water out, and Jesus says, I want to give you living water, referring to himself. But listen, church, he makes her aware that her lifestyle will never fulfill her. It truly will leave her desiring more, in this case, always being thirsty for more. And so they have this great conversation going back and forth. And let's jump into the middle of their conversation. In verse 15 in John 4, we read these words. And the woman said to him, well, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. You might say, man, that's pretty harsh, Jesus. Did you have to go there? You know, couldn't you have said, listen, I know that she's, you know, I'm God. I know that she has 
had five husbands. I know she's living with a guy right now, and, and I know that's contrary to what the Word of God says, so she, that's why she needs me. Let me just tell her the good news without ever commenting on any kind of sinful behavior. That fits perfectly in our culture today. Like, who are you to tell me what's wrong or right? Jesus says, well, you better because I do that. Let's go on with this. See, Jesus calls out the way she is living in order to offer her the better way of life found only in himself. He doesn't do it to be hateful, and nor should we ever call out someone's sin to be hateful. But listen, we can't be saved from something if we don't know what the problem is. We have to know where we're wrong, where we're going the wrong way. Actually pointing that out is a very loving thing. And that's what Jesus does. See, the path to deep, deep transformation must begin with confronting the sinful patterns in your life. And now we're concerned about other people confronting. But listen, what about yourself? We can confront ourselves, can't we? Are we willing to look at ourselves, be vulnerable enough to stop explaining it away and comparing with other people and saying, I want to look at my life as God looks at my life? What would a pure, holy, perfect God say about what goes on in my brain, in my attitudes? in the words that come out of my mouth, how I treat people. What would he say? Not what my best friend would say or what I would say. What does God think? What does God think about me? Let's be brave enough, vulnerable enough to do that and be willing to point it out and say, I am wrong in this. This is detrimental to my life and other people's life. This is sinful. I'm going to call it out. It's not a popular word these days, but it is sin. I'm confronting myself, and right now, there might be something spinning in your, in your mind and in your heart right now at this time where I'm preaching, and God is trying to use these words and saying, listen to Mike, because it's not just him. I'm using him, and I'm calling it out in your life right now, and perhaps it's something that only you yourself know of. Quit playing around with it. Confront it. Do you really want transformation? Do you really want the chains to break and fall that we sang about earlier? The the addictions, the quiet, private sins. Do you want to be freed from that? Listen, you have to confront it. You have to allow God to take charge to break those chains. For the woman at the well, it happened in an actual encounter and conversation with Jesus who drew attention to the destructive patterns in her life. Again, Jesus might be trying to call things out in your life that are making it difficult for you to become the person he wants you to be. Here's the thing. You know, we want good things for ourselves, but man, I believe with all my heart, God wants more from you. And not like a a slave owner that wants more from his slave. No, he wants more for you to bless you, to have great things going on in your life and through your life for the kingdom of God. Oh, you can do so much. It's like an aggravated coach, you know, of a track team that says, man, if you just would put the work in, you're so amazing. You, You could be on the Olympic team, but you won't practice. You won't watch what you eat. You don't have any desire I think God looks at us the same way sometimes. What are you doing playing around with this sinful stuff? Oh, the things I could do in you. Oh, the things that I could accomplish through you for my glory in this kingdom. Oh, man, quit playing around. Let me coach you. And we're satisfied eating the Twinkies and the devil's food cake and the showing up to practice every other week. We'll never be the runner we could be. We're never going to be the follower, the warrior for Christ that we can be as long as we're playing around with the temptations in our lives and we're playing the game. The call today is drop that stuff, surrender and follow me. Stand out. Stop trying to fit in. You know, maybe you know you can keep friendships if you just fit in and follow their lead. Maybe Jesus is offering you the better way of life right now. 
just like the encounter with the woman at the well, Jesus is offering you right now living water that will satisfy you truly. And I just want to say this, church, are you willing, if God is working in your heart right now in this moment, whether you're here, whether you're at home, and you sense God is doing something, are you willing to confront your conforming lifestyle? The message of the Bible invites you into the transformative power of God. The transformative power of God. It is not just something you hear about or can sing about every now and then. Listen, you will live it. It will be your story because your life story is not finished. There's a new chapter that's just waiting to be written and it starts with, God, forgive me. Help me that I might have victory over these things in my life. Forgive me for trying to be a friend of the world, trying to fit in when I should be standing out as a totally sold out follower of Jesus Christ. Forgive me, God, for playing the game, which is so easy and comfortable to do. So he invites you to experience the transformative power of God. But here's the question. Do you want the transformative power of God? I mean, do you want it? Do you want it? Or are you satisfied? Do you want the transformative power? <laughs> you know, if you're here today and you're trying to figure out why the negative pattern in your life still seems to be present, man, I'm still struggling. There's no getting over it. These chains got me. They'll never fall. I, 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 this is just my existence. You know, maybe, just maybe, it has a correlation to the time you spend with God in his word. Because what changed this lady was not the water in the well. It was the personification of the living water himself, Jesus Christ. She had to hear from God, right? How do we hear from God? Primarily through the word of God. Certainly through others, through the spirit speaking to us from within ourselves. But listen, you can't get around it. Spending time in the word of God is key. Can't get around it. And, this, and your temptation to say these two words... Yeah, but throw it out in the trash. Get rid of it. Just pretend like you don't even know the words. Yeah, but spending time with God. See, it's not just reading words on a page. It's if we if we change our perspective that I'm meeting with almighty God, kind of like Moses speaking to the burning bush. How are your encounters with God? Well, I kind of read a verse every now and then. Man, you're not meeting with God. You know, you're kind of walking by the table and stealing a little snack and throwing it in your mouth. We need to feast on the word of God, not just so we can cram more theology in our head, but so that we might experience the transformation of an almighty God in our hearts and souls. And then it will just pour out and seep out for God's glory and affect the world around us. Look, I believe that the more time we spend with God, the more we will begin to look like Jesus. There's no shortcut. You can listen to all the Christian music you want. Whatever genre of music you like, that's great. That's a great way to worship God. Does not replace Word of God. You can listen to all the podcasts and your favorite preachers and teachers. You know, we're, we're inundated, right? Wow! Does not replace you going solo with God and his word. There's just no, there's no replacement, right? Ed, there's no replacement, is there? You know, man, I, t I talk with Ed, love this guy. Love your dad, man. This guy knows what it means to commune with God. Of being obedient to him where he looks forward to the presence of God. You know, I, I've talked with, uh, I know you're, you're here because I saw you earlier, Tony, right in the back here. Tony, we've talked many times on the phone, and she shared with me that, oh, I'm not alone. You know, bless, bless her, you know, her husband passed away a time ago. She lives by herself, but she says, you know something, I'm not alone. I meet with Jesus. He's here. I sense him. I'm with him. Oh, man. You guys, you don't know what that does to my soul. You know, that is so transformative to hear this testimony. I want more of that in my life. And here's the thing. I don't have to ask, man, how do you do it? 
That's how you do it, right? Tony, right? No shortcuts, right? Got to get in the Word. We get to get in the Word. We heard we give because we get to give. We read because we get to. We have many brothers and sisters around the world. They don't have this, do they? They find one page and they huddle around a fire and they just drink it in. I've seen videos where Christians in countries where they're persecuted and a shipment of Bibles were snuck in and they get it and they cry, they hug it to their heart and they kiss the Bible. They value it so much. And we're like, wait, where's our Bible? What? Here, is it in the back seat? What, what do we do with that thing? Yeah. Not just to gild us, but man, I mean, to wake us up. A friend of the world. I know, as Paul says in Romans 12, 2, we need to have our minds renewed. You, you are in need of spiritual and mental renewal. I, I know this church, anytime, any place, God is ready to meet you right where you are to take you where he wants you to be. Oh, man. So we're not so far gone that God says, yeah, you're damaged goods. Oh boy, you big hypocrite. You look one way on Sundays. You might even go to a connect group. I know who you really are. You're playing the game. Get out of my face. No, no, no. He's actually saying, come on, let me give you a hug. Let, let's get together on this. Stop trying to fit in, Christian. I don't care if you're 15, 25, or 65. Stop trying to fit in and stand out. Again, not for streaming hatred, but simply knowing God, letting him transform you. And as far as behavior, as far as words, as far as attitudes, my friend, God's in control of that. It'll just come out. You don't have to try to talk religious. You be yourself and let God work through you. And man, it'll just come out. It'll just come out in your life. Oh, that God would have total control of us. Oh, that we would fight that urge to fit in. As I call the worship team to the stage, I want to ask you a few questions and our time is over. Many of you I know are faithful in the Word of God. And you are spending time in meeting with God. When you spend time reading the Word, you are not just trying to store up knowledge you're trying to discover God and experience the riches that he has for you in meeting with him. But if this is a church like many churches, there are some that have nothing but excuses. It's time those, those end. I don't know who you are, but God does. And I think he would be saying to you, if you've just been giving excuses as far as why you're trying to fit in and not stand out, he would say, listen, if you really are one of mine, you're really a hypocrite for acting like the world. Stop doing that right this second. You don't have to wait till tonight or this afternoon. Right now. Stop making excuses and figure out a time to meet with him. What needs to happen in your daily routine to make room for the word of God? What has to happen? What are you going to do about it? Oh, I'll think about it sometime. Stop it. What are you going to do about it? I, I want us to, every one of us individually who have had that, and come on, you know, I don't know, but you know if that's you or not. Stop making excuses. Get it done. I need to meet with God. Why? It, it, it's a win-win, not the lose, lose, lose. It's a win-win where, man, my, my, myself, I'll please my father. My own life will be, be transformed. I will experience the transformative power of God in my life. And I'll be able to impact this world like I haven't been. God, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to figure out a way. And I'm going to make it happen today. And if I can't figure out a time to make it happen daily, to meet with you, God, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to make a point that I'm going to get my daily planner or something, and I'm going to get it handled before I put my head on the pillow tonight. Hey, let's be doers of the word.
let's not just not let's just not sit here and take notes let's let's live it out let's do it I, i'm saying to you and i think god is saying to you what is your plan not your wife's plan not what you've done stop telling me why you can't what is your plan to make this a priority and get it done this is a win-win. Satan wants to distract you and give you this reason and that reason. And oh, I forgot. Darn. Okay, yeah, listen. Make it happen. I'm telling you something. If, if we had 20 people, just 20 people, do that and really do it, within two weeks, we're going to start seeing revival. And we won't have to schedule anybody to give up here and get a talk, or get up here and give a talk. We're going to see it. It's going to seep out of them, out of their pores. Don't you want that in your life? Don't you want it? Don't you want it to be real? Are you satisfied? See, God desires to see you transformed. He's that coach saying, oh, if you'd stop goofing off at track practice, if, you, if you'd start to eat right, if, man, if you just care about being a better runner, oh, there's so much potential. How many right here in this room, right here, just this, in this room, would our father, if he could come stand here, he'd say, oh, there's so much I could do in your life. Oh, your, your relationship with me would blow you away. You've just been so numb to the fact of going along the religiosity thing, you don't have a clue. But man, trust me in this. You start doing this, I'm going to blow your mind. But you can't have it both ways, remember. you got to give it all. So the question is, do you want it? Do you want the transforming power? Have you been trying to fit in rather than stand out? And so I say this, not because of anything I'm saying, but are you sensing God saying to you this morning, it's time you rededicate yourself to me. And you need to do it now. And say, God, by the grace of God, with your help, God, I, 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 listen, I can't do it on my own. Great, that's fantastic. That's step number one. <laughs> I can't do it on my own. Oh, but God can do it through you. Would you rededicate yourself to the Lord? Would you, do you sense him saying, hey, wake up and he's nudging your shoulder. He keeps nudging your shoulder and it's not your wife, but that's the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, come on, let's do it. Stop trying to fit in. I want you to stand out. When you go to that restaurant, when you go to that place of business, when you go to work tomorrow, when you go into your home, Come on, I want you to stand up for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, as the band leads us, the worship team leads us in this song, I'm going to ask you to come to the front. There's just something about, okay, God, I want to stand for you, and I'm going to start with a step for you. And I'm going to ask you to come, come forward here and just ask God in dedication, maybe even hit your knees and saying, I'm not fooling, God. I'm not fooling around. Please. Move in me. You know my struggles. You know my hang-ups. I leave them to you. The biggest transformation is being born again. You haven't even experienced that yet. And I'm going to ask you to come forward if you will. And I'll be standing over to the side. And if you want to learn how to become a follower of Christ, I'll be thrilled to show you how. I might even take someone else and say, listen, they can share with you too. We'd be thrilled to say, you know, you want the biggest transformation in your life? You don't have to fly solo anymore. God will walk through it with you. You'll have a relationship with the living, powerful God. This is what it's all about, folks. So I invite you now to stand as we sing. But if you sense the Holy Spirit saying, it's time to rededicate your life right now. Stop trying to fit in. Stand up. Stand out for Jesus Christ. And let me transform you. I'll show you what I can do. Let's do it. Let's sing to the Lord.
and stars they went the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him
with that, I just want to dismiss you guys and just go have a great week. Don't leave what Pastor Mike said this morning in this room. Take it with you this week and walk it out. If you need any prayer, we just want to encourage you to come forward and talk to our prayer team this week. Um, I understand it can be a little intimidating with everyone watching you to come up. So if you just want some private prayer, uh, you can come up here and get that. But uh, with that, I just want to say I hope you guys have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday. I'm so glad you joined us today. And I pray that God met you in a meaningful and powerful way. If you are new, remember to introduce yourself in the comments, even after the video ends. You have already taken the first step, and we want to help you figure out what's next. Use the QR code on the screen to be directed to our website, where an icon on the bottom left of your screen will prompt you to consider some next steps in your faith journey. We would love to help you connect to Grace by joining a connect group or by serving on one of our teams. Or if you have made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to help you take the next step by getting baptized. Don't hesitate. Take the next step today, and we'll see you right here next week.